Okay, today I'm going to talk about uh, Barclay, uh, Bishop Barclay. He was born in 1685 in Ireland, and he died in 1753. He's one of the British empiricists. The British empiricists were Locke, John Locke, whom we've already, already talked about a little, uh, Barclay, and then Hume. Locke uh, came from England. Barclay from Ireland, and David Hume from Scotland. So they're all part of Great Britain. That's why they're called the British empiricists. And the, the British empiricists are usually contrasted with the continental rationalists, Descartes, uh, Leibniz, and Spinoza. Descartes from France, Leibniz from Germany, and Spinoza from the Netherla Netherlands. The empiricists were the people who believed that all knowledge is rooted in sense experience. And at first, that sounds very common sense. I mean, it, like, uh, you, you know, it's a, 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 a lot of people feel that uh, idealism is very, very strange where everything is, is uh, you know, where idea, these ideas exist independently of sense perception. Uh, empiricism seems much more real, you know, like things that are real that we can see and touch. And uh, so modern science is often considered empirical science because what it what it what what it expects you to believe in or to 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 believe that exists are things that you can actually experience. So John Locke um, believed that all knowledge begins with experience, and so did Berkeley, and so did Hume, but they came to very very different conclusions. Uh, if you remember John Locke, if John Locke, if you ask John Locke, what, what, uh, tell me to tell you, tell you something about this apple. Locke would say this apple is a substance. Uh, it has primary qualities and secondary qualities. The primary qualities would be the shape, the volume of it, uh, the, uh, the mass, uh, whether it's at motion or at rest or at motion. Basically, the primary qualities are the mechanical properties, the qualities that can you can quantify. That base, that's what phys, phys, physicists deal with, scientists deal with the, with the uh, primary qualities. The secondary qualities would be the, 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 the color, the red, or if you bit into it and tasted the apple, the taste. Uh, these, and if you smelled it, it, the apple has a certain smell. Uh, these uh, qualities are secondary, meaning that they are not in the apple. They are dependent upon our mind. They are actually perceptions in our mind. That was John Locke. And if you ask Locke, uh, what is this apple? What is the substance? Locke would say, it's something I know not what. If there's something out there, it's material, it's a material body, but he doesn't know what it is because he can't see the object, the substance. He can only see what the substance looks like. It's red and has a certain shape and so on. Barclay, what Barclay did was to accuse Locke of being inconsistent because Locke said, as an empiricist, all knowledge is based upon experience. And if that's true, how can Locke consistently maintain that there is some substance out there, something I know not what? Uh, because uh, Barclay would say, how can you uh, be consistent saying that? Because you, 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 on the one hand, you say all knowledge is based upon experience. Uh, and then on the other hand, you believe that there's something there which we can't experience. That's why it's something I know not what. As Bertrand Russell said, John Locke, when confronted with the contradiction, would always uh, resolve the contradiction by uh, basically appealing to common sense. For Locke, it was just uh, it was just obvious uh, common sense that there is something here, and one and one demonstration of that is this. I mean, if I close my eyes and you, and there's no apple there, and I open them, I can't see any apple. On the other hand. When I open my eyes and there is an apple there, I see it. I have no power uh, over what what I see, and that that Locke takes that as as a kind of a, a proof that there really is something there. If there wasn't something there, uh, when I open my eyes, uh, why is it why is it that I I, I have no power? I have to see something, and when you take it away, I I don't see something. So that that indicates that. There really is something there, even though it's something I don't know what. Basically, what Barclay did is to say that uh, 
is to get rid of the the substance. For Barclay, there is nothing there. So he would disagree with Locke. Locke says there's something there, it's something I know not what, but Barclay would say there isn't there. And basically his reasons, you can... Uh, uh, he, Barclay goes on and on and on, basically saying the same thing. Uh, and at one point he says, you know, basically he could say what he believes in a couple sentences. But he's a beautiful writer. He's one of the great writers. He's a beautiful writer. Uh, there are the dialogues between uh, Philonous, Philonous and Hylus. Hylus in Greek means matter, and, and Philonous is the love of mind. So the, the, the dialogues are, if you want to read some beautiful dialogues, read Barclay, the three dialogues between Phil, uh, Hylus and Philonous. It's all about his, uh, his view of the reality. Basically, what Barclay believes is that there is nothing there, that this apple is simply an idea in my mind. And basically, there are three steps that lead to this. He says, what are, uh, what are mountains, rivers, and the things that we perceive by our senses? What all the different things that we perceive by our senses? Mountains, uh, flowers, trees, rivers, uh, all the apples, oranges, cars, buildings, what are they? Barclay would say there are things that we perceive by our senses. If I say, look at this apple, and, I, and, I, and you say, well, what apple? There's no apple there. Yeah, why, why is there no apple there? Be because you don't see anything. But now if I say, look at this apple, yeah, you do. You look at the apple. An apple, an object, is something you perceive by your senses. If you can't see it, or you can't touch it, or you can't uh, smell it, then there's nothing there. So uh, an object, a material object, is something that we can perceive. That's step number one. Okay, step number two is this. What do we, so an object is something we perceive with our senses. Step number two is what do we perceive except our ideas or sensations? In, in Locke's day, in Barclay's day, ideas, that's what ideas meant, meant sensations. An object is something we perceive. Well, what do we perceive? We perceive sensations. I, this apple, I perceive red. I perceive a shape. That, that's what we perceive. Step, so that's two. Objects are things we perceive. We perceive sensations or ideas. And the third step is sensations and ideas can only exist in a mind perceiving them. You can't have a, a sensation without somebody experiencing it, right? Sensations depend upon a mind experiencing something. You can't have a perception of red unless there's a mind that has that perception. Um, and so that's, and, and, and therefore, since uh, 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 ideas and sensations cannot exist without being experienced, they cannot exist without a mind perceiving them. And then he sums it up by saying, essay to be is percipi. Essay, it's often, sometimes it's est. Essay est percipi in Latin, but he, he puts it essay is percipi. To be is to be perceived. This is one of the, uh, next to Descartes' cogito ergo sum, this is one of the most famous uh, expressions in philosophy. And, and Descartes' thesis, essay is percipi, Essay is Percipi is one of the most interesting philosophical theses ever uh, propounded. And Locke wrote this in his 20s. I mean, he, he, was, uh, uh, he wrote all his great philosophical works when he was very young. Um, then he came over from Ireland. He came over to Yale. Actually, the library at Yale, the library was actually began, the Yale library actually began with uh, uh, Barclay uh, de dedicating or donating his, uh, his own personal library to Yale. And he, Barclay came over here. He was going to start a college in Bermuda. And none, none of this worked out. Um, but anyway, he, uh, the, the, at Yale, there's a college called Barclay after after Bishop Berkeley, he became a bishop in Ireland, and uh, oh, the city of Berkeley is named after Berkeley. So, um, okay, so that's basically Berkeley's thesis: essay is to, to essay is per, uh, to, to be is to be perceived. Essay est to percipi. So, what Berkeley does is he basically, you know, Locke had said that the secondary quality, like the red of the apple, is in the mind, so that. For Bar for Locke, the secondary qualities are to be to be a secondary quality is to be perceived, the taste and the touch, and the, the color and the sound. These are all in the mind, 
What Barclay says that not only the secondary qualities, but even the primary qualities are exist only in the mind. So basically what Barclay did is he got rid of the primary qualities and he says that every quality is a secondary quality in Locke's sense of the word. So to be is to be for safe. If you're going to do the uh, Venn diagram, uh, I'll do the Venn diagram for Barclay. So you have two circles. Uh, yeah, in this circle, you have subjective, sub, subjective ontology. Every over here is um, uh, observer dependent. So, and out here are things that are not observer dependent, like rocks and trees. Barclay doesn't believe there is anything out here. So Barclay, would, this is all gets wiped out. There's nothing here and there can be nothing here. So for Barclay, basically all you have are, are, you have everything is subjective ontology. There is nothing that has an objective ontology. So over here you have souls or minds, and then are the over here you have the ideas. Uh, and, and then God is the infinite soul or mind. So basically that's Barclay's uh, ontology if you're gonna do it in a Venn diagram. You, everything is wiped out except for, every, everything is in the subjective ontology circle. You have, there's only basically reality for Barclay uh, is composed of souls, minds, or spirits, and ideas. So that's it. That's Barclay. Um, you, you might wonder, for example, how is it then that we, if everything is simply an idea, like this apple, for example, is simply, is, there is no apple here. Why is it that we all see an apple? Why is it I bring 10 people in the room uh, and 10 people will see this apple? Uh, and Barclay's answer to that is that God is creating this idea, this idea of the apple in all of our minds. So there's this infinite spirit God who has the power of creating things that we call real. Like we all point to a mountain or a tree or this apple here. We call it real. But for Barclay, there's nothing here. This is simply an idea in our minds but it's created by God in all of our minds. So that's why we all see the same thing. Now, for example, if I'm crazy and I'm hallucinating and I say, look at this apple and I, and I see an apple here, but nobody else sees it. Then when you say, there's no apple there, there's no apple there because we don't all share that, that vision of it. But the things that we call real things are for Barclay ideas that have been implanted in all our minds by this infinite spirit, God. The laws of nature for Barclay are simply that the the orderliness of the ideas that God has created. So we can, since God is good, God has created these ideas in our minds in an orderly fashion. So, for example, when you see a fire, you know that if you stick your hand in that fire, you'll feel pain. Well, there really is no fire there, independently of, of God's creating that fire in our minds. And so what God does is he establishes an order between you perceive a, a fire and then you put your hand in it and then you also feel the, you'll feel pain. All of these, so that's the, that would be the laws of nature. God has created these ideas in an orderly fashion. Um, when, what happens when, um, uh, like, uh, you're, you're in a classroom and you see the desk, the, the tables, uh, everybody sees it. What happens at three o'clock in the morning when no one is there? Is there a table there? Well, why, how can there be if nobody's perceiving it? Barclay would say there is a table there because God is perceiving it. Somebody wrote Bertrand Russell, uh, uh, John, Ronald Knox wrote Bertrand Russell a limerick. And it goes like that about Barclay. It goes like this. There was a young man who said God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that, there, that, that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. Dear re replies, dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I, God, am always about in the quad, and that's why this tr the con this tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. Anyway, that's Barclay. Um, he's a subjective idealist. He believe he's an empiricist. He believes all knowledge is based upon experience. The only Things that we experience are ideas or sensations. There are no material objects, mind independent. So for Barclay, everything has a subjective ontology. Everything, in reality, everything is a mind or an idea. That's Barclay. Very interesting um, uh, view. Very and fascinating.